As we uh, turn to our time in the Word this morning, we are nearing the end, the, the never-ending end, of our series in the book of James. We've been going through James for a few months now. I don't remember how long. Uh, certainly the summer. And we, in this time, through the book of James, we've been looking at different ways that we can trust God. So each week we have a usually different blank to fill in. Uh, but we're calling it trusting God with blank. And then each week is a different thing, usually. Last week, we did trusting God with life. And this week, we're doing trusting God with life part two. Uh, and I think next week, we're going to have a part three. Um, but there's good reason for that, I think, uh, hopefully. And uh, before I get into this week's, just to remind us to, of, of the context of the whole thing, Uh, The idea behind that is we know that we trust God with salvation. That's the the basic thing that that all Christians affirm and and proclaim is that we trust in God for salvation. But so often we struggle to trust him with other things. And so each week we've looked at different parts of life that we need to, to trust God with. And, and last week, we began looking at trusting him with life itself, uh, particularly when someone is sick, uh, but also broader things. So we, we talked about that a bit last week. Throughout the book, though, James continues to assert that, that life has difficult pieces. Life is hard. But God is still trustworthy. No matter how difficult things are, we can still trust God with whatever it is that we're facing. At the same time, he doesn't want us to just let go and let God, to just not do anything. And he emphasizes that what we do still matters. And there's a lot of Emphasis on both trusting God, but also trusting God in a way that leads to action. And so there's that famous passage in the middle about faith and works, that you show your faith by your works, that that what you do is a reflection of what you believe about God. Throughout that whole back and forth of those concepts, James touches on three major issues in the life of the church. One is that there are difficult things, trials, sufferings, persecutions that are experienced by people in a variety of ways. And he uses words that really try to cover all of whatever you could fit into that. So sometimes we try to be too specific and say it's only about this kind of difficulty. But James is pretty clear that it's all the difficult things in life. And then he talks about the need for wisdom as a universal thing that we need, especially as we're facing difficult things in life. And then there's, there's conflict between people in the church, and he addresses that in a variety of different ways. And um, we've seen that over and over and over again, that, that the unity of the body is critical to our growth in Christ. Well, as I mentioned last time, we began looking at this concept of trusting God with life. And and we broke that into two basic things. One is trusting him with life without exceptions. That's to say that no part of life is free from our need to trust God with it. And then without limitations, that we we don't put limits on what God can do and what we're willing to entrust to his care. This week, we're gonna kind of zero in a bit. So that that passage last week began in James chapter 5 verse 12 and went all the way through verse 18. This week we're going to look at James 5 verse 14 and the beginning of 15. And we're really talking specifically about when someone is sick, when we want God to heal somebody. That's what we're going to be really focused on this morning. And then next week we'll deal with a different part of that section Uh, having to do with confession of sins. So I know that you're all going to be so excited to come back to hear about that next week. Uh, But these are things that are pretty significant and that James talks about in somewhat particular ways. 
And I, as I got into things last week, I mentioned that there's just, there's a lot here that we really should sit with and spend some time unpacking further. So this week we're going to unpack more about what it looks like to trust God with life, particularly the concept of healing. And, and what does that really look like? How do we do that? How, what, are, what are things that we all would acknowledge are, are errors in the way that people do or don't do that? What are some pitfalls? What are some, just the, the, the actual practical things. So if you were hoping for like a, a more in-depth, theological, academic, all those words that people love so much, study, Go listen to last week's sermon. Uh, this is going to be geared more towards what do we do with the foundations that were laid last week. So with that in mind, let's start by just looking to those verses again. And I, I think they should show up on the screen for those who didn't bring a Bible with them this morning. James says, is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. This is God's word for us this morning. Before I do unpack the implications, let's go to him in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can come to you with, with everything. As we look at this passage again and in, in other details this morning, I pray that you would continue to speak to us through your word. That you would bring to mind the different situations that we have faced, that you have brought into our lives for a variety of reasons, and, and your faithfulness in all of those things. Lord, I pray that you would help us to think clearly and well about what it looks like to trust you with life. Lord, I pray that you would speak through me and the things that you've led me to prepare and that you would use all these things to prompt each of us as we endeavor, as we try to trust you with healing in our lives and in the lives of others around us. Lord, I pray that you would help us not only to understand with our minds, but to, to be transformed by your spirit in how we um, live how we care for each other, how we, how we communicate with each other about what it looks like to trust you for healing. Lord, I, I do thank you that you have shown us your ability to heal and that we all have examples we can point to of, of your power. Lord, I pray that as we wrestle with some of some of the other experiences that we've had. That this morning you would comfort us, that you would remind us of your goodness, that we would be renewed in our hope in you. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the reasons I think that we need to pay more attention to this passage is that we all might have stories of times where God healed, but we all also have stories of times where we prayed for healing and God didn't do what we asked him to do. And I think it's good and appropriate and helpful to wrestle with those things, with that tension between God's promises and how we experience his work and his, his answers to our prayers. And sometimes when it seems he's silent. I want to start by just going to the affirmation side. 
that trusting God with life, trusting him with healing, begins with going to the source of life, of healing. That James does tell us that that's how we receive healing, is by bringing the requests to God. That God is the source of healing in our lives. He is the God of life, and he does heal. And that's something, again, that we can, we can say sometimes more strongly than others because of our mixed experiences. And when I think of churches like ours and the kind of tradition that we're a part of, and when we think of the broader context of churches that are not like ours and make different statements about God healing... Sometimes we have a hard time affirming fully God's power and even desire to heal because we're afraid of of saying that God's going to do something that he's not going to do. We're afraid of becoming like people that we've seen who, who falsely proclaim God's work in situations where he's not working in those ways. But it's good for us to remember, to be reminded, that that God is the God of life. That he does bring life where there is otherwise death. That he restores dead people to life. So whatever experience or exposure we've had to people who might overpromise and underdeliver in God's name, we affirm that he has not stopped healing people just because there are some people out there making false claims. He still does that sort of work in our lives and in the world around us. Scripture is pretty consistent that, and I hesitate because there, there's, there's going to be a correction to, to over, overstatement of this coming, I promise. But I hesitate because this has been used just as negatively in the lives of people. But when Scripture talks about God not healing, it's more likely, dramatically more likely, to say it's because people didn't believe God would heal than that they promised something that he wasn't willing to do. So we have maybe a history and a culture of certain types of churches making claims, certain preachers making claims that God is going to heal if you just have enough faith and it's a guarantee that you ha- it's, you're the problem. We We appropriately shy away from being associated with that kind of approach. But sometimes we do that, we swing the other direction. And then we, we, we don't think that God is going to do anything at all. And, and scripture is, is pretty aggressive in saying that we, we should trust God to heal. That is within his character, and it is descriptive of the kinds of things that he does. Scripture also, though, as I mentioned, here's a, here's a corrective to that too. It also cautions us from proclaiming that we know why someone's prayer has not been answered. So as much as I would say we need to be careful not to assume that God won't heal. We also need to be careful not to say, oh, that person hasn't been healed because they doubt. We don't know. We don't know how much they are clinging to God in their situation and just receiving silence. We don't know their struggle more often than not. A great example of this is the entire book of Job. Is 
people who understood a lot about God's character coming around a friend who was suffering and saying, oh, this is because of you. You did this, or you did that, or you didn't do this, or you don't believe God will do this. And, and by the end of the book, we, we see a, a call for sacrifices for sin to be made on behalf of those friends. That, that they overstepped in assigning the reason for Job's suffering. So there's a tension there that we need to wrestle with. That, that we acknowledge that God can and does heal. And there's a, there's a danger in shying away from that just as much as there's a danger in over-promising what God isn't going to deliver in a particular moment in a particular way. When... When there are appropriate attacks on doubt in Scripture, they come directly from God. So he delivers a message to a prophet to proclaim. Or Jesus himself accuses people of of not having faith. We don't see in Scripture a call to challenge each other in that way. We don't see... Uh, affirmation and a seal of approval on strongly opinionated people just saying whatever they think about somebody else's situation. Whether someone is claiming to guarantee healing or claiming they know the reasons why healing hasn't happened we must use discernment anytime somebody says they have some kind of special understanding from God about that situation. Why do they have it and no one else in the body of Christ does? Why is he speaking only through this person? Does it match up with with what Scripture says, first and foremost, but the reality of how God is moving and working in his people. God has not called us to make new promises on his behalf, but he also hasn't called us to doubt his power. He has called us to steadfastly trust him with everything, including our bodies. And sometimes when either we've experienced a lack of answer to prayer or or not the answers we want, or we've experienced some of the extreme versions of people over-promising and under... There's all sorts of reasons, but there, there are situations where we get to the point in our life where we're just not even willing to bring our requests to God. We don't think he's going to do anything with it. And the challenge this morning is to be reminded that in all things, we can and must trust God. I have um, a few stories sprinkled in this morning that um, hopefully are helpful. They're not by any means authoritative. So you shouldn't take them as being more, more weighty. Than, than what we see in Scripture. That's just a caution before I get into those. But hopefully they're helpful. I know a man who several years ago had a dramatic accident that led to chronic pain of dramatic proportions and was on all sorts of pain medications and everything else and they were not doing a whole lot for him. And for years, he had people praying for healing. And he still had pain. And one night, he was just at the end of his rope. And he said, Lord, I, I don't know what to do. And he sensed God saying, well, why don't you pray for healing for yourself? And it suddenly occurred to him that he had had other people praying for him. But he himself had never asked directly. 
So he prayed, said, God, please take this pain away. He went to bed. The next morning he woke up and the pain was gone. Yeah, praise God. Is that a normative experience? No. Not everyone has chronic issues because they haven't asked God directly for relief. Many people ask God multiple times a day for relief and don't receive it. But in this man's case, the issue was that he just had not taken the initiative to ask for healing himself. Something had become a barrier between him and bringing his request to God. My challenge this morning in delivering even that story is that there are some who will take that and again try to use it to describe why someone hasn't received healing. But that's not why I'm telling the story. I'm telling the story to help us remember that we need to bring our requests to God. That's all. It's just meant to be an encouragement. So my questions for us in this particular portion are are along those lines. What is it that keeps us from going to God for healing, for ourselves and for others? Is it that the, the situation is too small? We don't think that that needs God's attention? Or is it it's so big that it seems beyond what God would do? What prevents us from asking for God's healing work? Do we doubt his power? Do we doubt his goodness? Do we doubt his love and his care for us and for others? When should we encourage people, each other, to take requests to God that we are not bringing to him? And how can we recognize when that's not what someone needs? They are bringing their requests to God. And they need someone to walk alongside them in silence, bringing comfort. Experiencing the discomfort with them. Waiting together for God's response. That brings us to the next thing that I want to look at this morning, and that's the the idea that trusting God for life involves caring for one another. I mentioned that James says that we need to trust God, and we also need to do things, that our, our actions still matter. We see that in this passage, that what he he describes involves People from the church gathering around the person with physical things and spiritual things. Bringing a variety of tools to bear on the situation. But the, the thing in this particular moment that I want to draw our attention to is that it involves community. That the person in need of healing isn't an individual cut off from everyone else. Just doing their spiritual life with God on their own. They're connected to other people who are joining with them in seeking that healing. God calls us to take care of each other. When part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. He has designed us to be interdependent. That we depend on him, absolutely, but we also depend on each other. That's how God designed us to be. He uses it for all sorts of things. He uses it to humble us. That's a good starting point. How many of us, well, I'll get there. He uses it to humble us. He uses it to create opportunities for service. 
to, to be reminded of his love, his grace, his work in our lives, and to reflect that in the lives of those who are in need of it in theirs now. He uses it to strengthen relationships. He uses it to help the whole body of Christ to grow in spiritual maturity. He uses it for so much more than that, but that's a good starting point. To remember that, that more often than not, when we are in search of whether it's healing or some other incredible provision of the Lord, that he uses his people to be a part of how he answers those prayers. That his, his church is a significant and normative part of how he dispenses those works, those gifts. But this togetherness only works if we're both willing to give help and willing to receive help. So let's start with the willing to receive help part. Someone who I didn't ask for permission specifically was telling me about a struggle they've had with that, the willingness to receive help. And they gave an an example of being in the hospital and needing care from doctors, from nurses, right? And they come in to check up and say, how you doing? What do you need? Oh, I'm fine. I don't need anything. Meanwhile, They're not fine. They need all kinds of things. And their reluctance to voice that inhibits their ability to receive the help. It hurts the doctors and nurses' ability to do their jobs. It doesn't help anyone to withhold the truth of how we're doing. Now, that's that's an example just in terms of doctors and nurses. But that gets extended very easily into how we communicate with each other in the life of the church. If I'm not willing to tell you I need help, how how am I going to get help? And if we're not willing to to give help, why would we expect anyone to tell us they need it? If we aren't willing and ready and able to respond, why would we expect anyone to tell, the, tell us and be vulnerable about their need for help? Another piece, though, is that we tend to be better at, at short-term responses. So somebody has a a well-defined need we we respond with the 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 quickness we have systems we have structures we know okay we need somebody to go and visit them on these days and we need somebody to bring the meals on those days and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we we can map it all out but what about longer term things what if somebody has a chronic illness that lasts for years. How do we care for that person? It's harder. It's messy. It tends to be unpredictable, both in what they need and the amount of time they're going to need it. How often will they need that kind of attention? And There's a couple keys to to dealing with that. One is commitment on behalf of the church to say, however long it takes, whatever that looks like, we want to help. And then actually doing that. And then communication is key. to, To actually ask people, how are they doing? What do they need? And for them to say, This is truly how I'm doing. This is what I need. That that constant building of that relationship is critical 
to long-term care. So often when we talk about healing, we're really talking about curing. We pray that God will, we say heal, but what we really mean is cure, the instant cure, the, the snap your fingers and everything's better. But healing takes time. When, when you heal from an injury, there's a process. So let's say you get a, a cut, a deep cut. Your body heals, but it, it takes some time. Your blood has to clot. Skin has to grow in. But eventually, you're, you, you heal. You're usually not insecured from a cut. I suppose a small one, maybe, sort of. There are so many things where God is at work to bring healing into someone's life over a slow, long process that involves so much patience and endurance and perseverance And he calls us as his body to not just say, well, we went that one time. We're good, right? But to walk alongside each other all the way through the journey. So when do we call for help? What problem is too big or too small to ask other people to help us out. And when do we offer help? Is it only for certain kinds of problems? Certain amount of time? How do we care for each other when prayer seems to be unanswered? That's a big one to sit with because... So often, our response to that question in the life of someone else, whether we intend it or not, communicates that we think God has given up on them, and so we do too. How do we meet people where they are on their journey of healing And walk with them through what God is doing in their lives. As God is doing it, not as we wish he was doing it. Trusting God with life involves caring for one another. We show that we expect God to continue to work by Continuing to be a part of that work. Finally, I want to end with the idea that that trusting God with life involves clinging to eternity. This is the the kind of point that on the surface is going to sound like it should be all, all positive and happy and upbeat. But with it comes some of the same opposites that the other ones had. God's work does not end with physical death. Death does not have the last word in our lives or in anyone else's. True healing is eternal. We read this morning from Psalm 46, and in the middle of that psalm, it's describing um, God's dwelling in in a particular place. It says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. This is one of my favorite images in scripture, and it happens not just in this psalm, but all over the place. This idea of 
rivers of life that spring forth from God's presence and provide healing, restoration, and life wherever they go. So there's this great passage in Ezekiel. I know everybody's like Ezekiel, but Ezekiel has this vision of this new city where God dwells, and there's this river that starts out in the most holy place, and it trickles down. It starts out as literally a trickle, and this angel has him start measuring it. The further he gets from the temple, the bigger and deeper the river gets. And after he gets done measuring it, the description is, is, is that it basically ends at what we know as the Dead Sea, which is so known because it's mostly salt water, so salty that really nothing can live there. But in Ezekiel's vision, he gets there and the angel says, now look around. What do you see along the banks of this river? And along the banks, there are trees that provide fruit. And in the water, in the sea that was the Dead Sea, there's fish. In Revelation, John has a similar vision of the city of God where he dwells with his people and a river that gives life. I think Jesus says something about that too, doesn't he? If you're thirsty, come to me and I'll give you living water. You'll never thirst again. Ultimately, healing happens in an eternal perspective. Jesus healed a ton of people, they all eventually died. They're not still with us. Death doesn't have the last word. He defeated death. We have hope of resurrection and of full restoration of how he designed us to be without the curse of sin, without without the maladies that we struggle with. My final story is about uh, someone who I've known my whole life. Uh, I have an uncle who was born blind. And as a little boy, his eyes became infected so much that they eventually had to be removed. And so he has had glass eyes for most of his life. And he grew up in a non-Christian home, but then as a college student became a Christian and began going to various churches. And every now and then he'd find himself in a church where they would say, well, we just need to lay hands on you and pray for healing and God will restore your sight. Yeah. If it weren't so sad in the depression that came on from him after they said, it's your lack of faith, it would be funny. It wasn't about his faith. His story is of God calling him to faithfully press on, to persevere, to trust God anyway, to cling to and to proclaim the hope of glory now until he sees it with his own eyes. We cling to eternity not because we don't expect God to be able to heal now, but because we know that whether he does what we ask, when he asks, how we ask, or not, one day he will make it all right. 
So how do we cling to eternal hope without losing sight of God's work here and now? Because that's the thing. So often when we say, well, people overpromise God's healing. We just need to wait for eternity. We dismiss what he's doing now. And when we focus just on the now, we get discouraged when he doesn't answer prayer. And we say, well, it must be because we don't have enough faith. We just need more faith. And the question is, do we trust him with life? When he doesn't answer the way we want and when we want, and do we trust him anyway? That he could do it. That he will do what he thinks is best. When he thinks it's best. As we wrap up this time. I'm just going to bring back three foundational truths. That have already been said. But I'm going to repeat them. But these things work together. So that's why I'm going to repeat it in this way. God is the God of life who does heal. He has called us to care for each other. And his work does not end with death. Because true healing is eternal. When we cling to these things, it gives us the wisdom that we need to endure, to persevere through seasons of waiting together for God's restorative work. And that's more often than not what it looks like. Is I, I often like to describe patient faith and faithfulness to God as aggressive as that clinging to the robes of Jesus as he passes by. The persistent prayer, day in and day out, for years, until it's finally answered. The the walking together through the pain, through the misery, through the awkwardness, through the difficulties. Because we have hope that that God's using all those things together for our good. I've been wrestling the last couple weeks a lot with how much to share personally. I've given stories about other people that I've known. But as many of you have walked through your own journeys of waiting, hoping, praying, grieving, I feel my journey is not unique, different, more important than anyone else's. So I've wrestled how much to share and how much not to share. And what I want to share is that it's not usually simple. It's not easy to ask over and over and over again for healing that doesn't come. It's not easy to ask for help when we need it. It's not easy to receive it either. It's not even easy to cling to the hope of eternity. Because, man, we, we want life now. We want to see life now. We want to see God's work now. 
none of those are reasons to stop. Trusting God with life may not be easy, but it's always worth enduring, continuing, persevering, steadfastly pursuing his healing in our lives and the lives of others. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you first and foremost for who you are. I thank you that you have all the power, all the wisdom, all the glory. That you have breathed life into us and you continue to do so. That you are a God who heals, who restores, who brings life where there is death and darkness and despair. That your hope endures, that we can trust you always with everything. Lord, I pray that you would continue to work in our lives as you have over the years in many of us, but that you would continue to work in us, that we would trust you steadfastly, unwaveringly, clinging with hope, knowing that you can bring life, that you will bring life in your time, in your way, and yet you care so much to hear from us about the pain along the way. Lord, I pray that we would not shrink back from bringing our requests to you, from expressing to you and to one another our need for redemption, for healing, that we would not grow weary of doing good, of helping each other along the way. That our glimpses of eternity now would give us the motivation, the, the joy that we need to press on even now. I pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.